All right, howdy y'all and welcome to the second of our fall 2020 Texas ACSM virtual lecture series. Uh, my name is Dustin Jobert. I serve as the continuing education director for Texas ACSM. Um, I have the pleasure today to present um, our, our speaker, Dr. Michael Roberts. Um, so Dr. Roberts is an associate professor in the School of Kinesiology at Auburn University, um, where he's the director of the Molecular and Applied Science Laboratory, as well as the Applied Physiology Lab. Um, he did his PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Oklahoma, but has Texas roots, having done his bachelor's and his master's from Baylor. Um, so his lab examines how exercise and nutrition affects variables related to health outcomes and athletic performance, with his current interests looking at protein supplementation, body comp assessment, and the molecular effects of exercise training with skeletal muscle. So that ties into his talk today on the resistance training adaptations to different loading schemes. Um, so before handing it off to Dr. Roberts, one final note, um, you guys can ask questions through the Q&A feature um, and we will fill those at the end. So feel free to uh, use that. Um, you should be able to see the questions that people are asking. You can even upvote them if you think any questions are particularly um, useful. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Dustin. I appreciate it. And thank you for everyone's time today. Um, especially via Zoom. Uh, this is a, a different way for me to present, but I appreciate uh, the invitation. So before I talk, well, let me get, I just uh, want to disclose that <clears throat> my laboratory does a lot of work uh, with nutritional supplement companies. So we do um, contracted work and we've done work for a variety of companies, some of which we'll discuss uh, today. And I also receive uh, internal grants um, from Auburn University as well as our medical school. And then I've received a, a grant, a collaborative grant through Florida a and University. I do serve as a paid scientific consultant to a few companies uh, as well. So what I wanna talk about today uh, really is something that's starting to gain a lot of traction in our field. And that's, uh, you know, the way you resistance train, is it binary in the sense that if you, you know, lift heavy weights for fewer repetitions, this purely promotes or primarily promotes strength uh, adaptation. Whereas if you, if you lift sort of lower volume, um, excuse me, lower load, but higher volume, right? Is this gonna predominantly facilitate skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And I sort of pose the question, you know, because this is, this, is, this is what the textbooks have historically said. Um, a, is this true? And, and B, if this, is, if this is true, is it uh, such a simple thing? Now, in terms of defining different load schemes and modalities for today's talk, uh, I just want to point out a few operational def definitions that I'm going to use. So when I talk about high load training, this would be uh, lifting uh, weights, you know, four sets of three at 90% 1RM. Granted, this is not a good picture. This is probably not this gentleman's 90% 1RM. But the idea here is that high load would be low volume and, and you're really lifting um, a lot of weight on the bar. Moderate load. Uh, would be something like doing four sets of 12 in the gym where you're at about 75% of your one rep max. And then low load, high volume training is doing, um, you know, four sets of 30, for example, um, where you're performing those repetitions at about 30% 1RM. So we have high load, which is close to 1RM, moderate load, which is your, your sets of 10 to 12, and then low load, high volume. Now, I'm pretty sure that a lot of us have, you know, read the NSCA's text, and you'll even find some of this in, in ACSM's publications. Uh, but the idea of training specificity is if you want to get stronger, um, you typically lift heavier weights. If you um, want to prioritize hypertrophy, then you sort of back off um, uh, the, the, the training load a little bit and, and you lift for more volume. And so that's the idea uh, behind training specificity when, when lifting weights. Um, for those that haven't really uh, been involved in, in 
uh, and some of these uh, research laboratory studies, you know, we can test this hypothesis by doing some sort of pre-testing battery, um, which, which would include body composition testing, strength testing, right? Um, so, so for example, we would get perhaps 50 participants in, in the laboratory. We would do a pre-testing battery to get their strength, their body composition. Our lab, we like, we like taking muscle biopsies. And then from there, we can have um, sort of group assignments, right? So we can split groups where one group would uh, basically engage in high load training for eight to 12 weeks. And then the second group would engage in perhaps higher volume training for eight to 12 weeks. And then we do this post-testing battery, uh, which is you know, 48 to 72 hours following uh, the, the last bout of training. In terms of the assessments that we do in our laboratory, we've done a variety of them. So you uh, were lucky to be right down the street from our MRI center, and we're able to get a mid-thigh um, sort of view, and, and we can ascertain uh, basically muscle area, and this can give us uh, mid-thigh or, or, or mid-leg muscle CSA. In our laboratory, we also have what's called a PQCT, so we work in collaboration um, with our medical school, and they've put this device in our lab. And it's, it's, it's the poor man's MRI is the way I like to describe it, but again, even though the res resolution is not as great, you can get mid-thigh uh, muscle uh, cross-sectional area. We also have an ultrasound in our laboratory, so we can get vastus lateralis uh, muscle thickness. Um, and then when, when we talk about biopsy data, right, we can get muscle fiber cross-sectional area, so we can start looking at you know, some, some of the cellular characteristics in terms of muscle hypertrophy. And, and we've become a lot more interested in some of what we call the ultra microscopic or structural adaptations that occur um, to exercise training. And so we have a electron microscopy core on campus and we can look at things such as the percent of um, cellular space occupied by myofibrils, the percent of cellular space occupied by non-contractile protein, uh, et cetera. So that's, that's just giving an overview of how these research studies work. Now, uh, one of the most cited studies I wanna bring to everyone's attention uh, was done um, by Campos et al. And what they did was they took three groups of college age men. Uh, one group was assigned to high load training. And so this is where they would lift uh, you know, heavy weights, uh, close to three to five uh, rep max training. Um, they had a second group, uh, which is sort of this, this moderate load group. And so they were training um, between nine to 11 uh, rep max. Um, so this would be close to 75% 1RM. And then they had a high volume training group, uh, which uh, they were doing, you know, sets of, of 20 to 28 repetitions uh, throughout training. Exercise was two days per week for eight weeks, and they prioritized uh, leg press, squat, and knee extensor training. Um, they did, you know, pre and post intervention testing batteries, and they took muscle biopsies and, and got strength metrics, et cetera. So I'm just presenting the type one muscle fiber CSA data, and we're just looking at the high load versus the high volume training groups. So uh, you could see here uh, with, with high load training, there was a 12% increase in type one muscle fiber CSA, and that was significant with high volume training. You had a similar trend. It didn't reach statistical significance, but, but nonetheless, about a 10% increase in hypertrophy. Uh, and then they, they looked at type 2 uh, fiber CSA, type 2A fiber CSA uh, changes. And clearly, with high load training, uh, there was a robust increase, around 23%. And there wasn't this increase with high volume training. Uh, now, this is looking at leg press strength adaptations, and this is showing you with high load training from pre to post, 
uh, there was a significant increase and a robust increase in leg press 1RM. Uh, high volume training, there was an increase, uh, but that increase wasn't as robust as high load training. Okay. Um, soon thereafter, Andy Fry had a really nice review article and he presented evidence uh, to suggest that high load training was superior uh, in eliciting both strength as well as hypertrophy adaptations. And so this came straight out of his review article. Um, long story short, when you look at the percent increase in strength, right? Uh, if you're training towards or close to your 1RM, you see a robust increase. And as you get further away from that, there's not a, uh, not as near as a robust increase in, in strength. And that applies for leg press strength as well as knee extension strength. And then uh, this graph right here basically illustrates um, the effects of training load on, on type two muscle fiber hypertrophy. And it shows an inverse relationship where if you train with higher loads, you, you typically see more robust increases in type two fiber cross-sectional area. And as you drift towards lower loads, you'll still see an increase, but it's not nearly uh, as robust, okay? So, you know, all this stuff was done back in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, back then it, it just was sort of uh, the, the paradigm, so to speak, to say, well, if you wanna get stronger and if you want your, your muscle to hypertrophy more, uh, you should be, be lifting heavier weights, right? Uh, so case closed until 2012. Uh, so, so many of you all have probably seen this study. This is done by Stu Phillips Lab. Um, and they, they had three training conditions. Uh, uh, in one training conditions, participants uh, perform uh, three sets of 30% one rep max training to failure. Uh, and the second condition, uh, each, each training bout was one set at 80% one RM to failure. And then in the third training condition, um, participants perform three sets uh, at 80% one RM to failure. Okay, training was three days per week for 10 weeks, and they did pre and post testing batteries, which included an MRI as well as muscle biopsies. So, so this is what's really striking uh, when, you, when you look at the data, and this is the MRI data looking at the change in quadriceps volume. This is the change in, in muscle area. Uh, it looks like, you know, training uh, with light loads, 30% 1RM, elicited similar increases in quadriceps uh, muscle area when compared to heavy training. So that sort of bucked the paradigm that we just discussed, okay? Um, they did show, or they did also present um, some of the one rep max training adaptations. And when they looked at leg extensor strength, they showed that all groups or all training conditions increased their strength. However, there was a little bit more of an increase in the 80% uh, training conditions versus the 30% training condition. Uh, now, this, is, this gets a little bit confusing because when they went to the BioDex, which looks at knee extensor peak torque, uh, the authors reported that there was a similar increase in knee extensor uh, peak torque, right? Um, while I'm not showing the muscle fiber data, um, what the authors reported was uh, both type one as well as type two fibers similarly hypertrophied in all of the training conditions. So that, uh, again, sort of bucks the paradigm, right? Uh, we discussed a second ago that if you want your type two fibers to hypertrophy more, you wanna engage in higher load training. Um, but what Stu, Stu's lab is suggesting with this paper is that it doesn't matter necessarily what you train with, um, whether it be higher volume or higher load, so long as you train um, to muscular fatigue or volitional fatigue, you should see similar training adaptations. So the great debate uh, I would call nowadays is, you know, if I train with light weights or heavy weights, 
um, will I ex experience similar training adaptations so long as I live um, to failure? And so a lot of studies have, have sought to sort of tackle this question. Um, I'm gonna present some data. A lot of it's um, from other individuals, some from our laboratory, um, which has, has tried or have tried to, to tackle this research question. So this is done by Joel Kramer's group, uh, Nate Jenkins, I think this is part of his dissertation, but he had two groups of college age males, uh, one group engaged in uh, training with loads that were about 80% of individuals one rep max. The second group was a group that trained using 30% one RM. Um, they just did le leg extension resistance training for six weeks. Um, and they did um, three sets per training session uh, and three training sessions per week, so three days per week. Uh, and they performed, you know, testing batteries that included ultrasound and some neuromuscular tests prior to and following this training intervention. So what you're looking at right here are ultrasound data. And this is showing uh, muscle thickness uh, at baseline, at, at midpoint training, and at uh, post-training. And it showed the slope of each line, right? So the, so the slopes are similar. So although, um, you know, at all time points, 80% 1RM training was higher than 30% 1RM training, that doesn't mean much because slopes being similar suggests that muscle hypertrophy um, across time was similar in both groups. So this agrees with Stu Phillips' data saying, whether it's high load training or high volume training, you can see similar increases in muscle hypertrophy. Um, this is one repetition knee extensor um, uh, max uh, values um, from each group. And so this uh, sort of, I guess, disagrees with, with Stu's data in the sense that clearly when you train with higher loads, according to, to Nate's data, you see this linear increase in strength uh, and when you train with higher volume and, and, and low loads, right, 30% 1RM training, um, you do get a little bit of an increase in 1RM, but it's not nearly as robust as training with higher loads here at 80% at 1RM, okay? And what I really liked about Nate's data was he used, I believe this was twitch interpolation in order to get uh, the... Um, some neuromuscular characteristics. So volunteer, the percent of motor units that are, that are sort of firing, um, you know, at baseline versus week six. And you can see here, uh, I'll just go to this so, sort of summary figure. This is at week six, but this shows you that the percent of motor units activated um, during voluntary contraction um, were higher after high load training compared to low load and higher volume training. So this, what this suggests is increases in strength with 80% one arm training could in part be due to neuromuscular adaptations. In particular, uh, we have this, this larger increase in the amount of motor units that can be voluntarily activated during, during a knee extensor task. Um, so we, we did a study, uh, we, actually a few studies, I'm gonna present two of them. So one study that we performed in this space was done by Cody Hahn, uh, and he really drove this, this, uh, this research topic in the laboratory when he was a PhD student in my lab. And then um, we did a chronic training study, and this is currently unpublished because we're waiting on the tracer data from McMaster University, but this was done by Chris Van in collaboration um, with Dr. Stu Phillips. Um, so the first study, by Cody is, is published in Physiological Reports. This is where we took 15 college age male participants. Uh, they came into the laboratory. They performed a biodex to get knee extensor peak torque, uh, as well as donated a muscle biopsy. They then did uh, just knee ex unilateral knee extensor training, or excuse me, bilateral knee extensor training, but they only did one exercise bout. And they performed four sets to failure at 30% one rep max. Right after that, they did another biodex, and then they gave a 15-minute post-exercise biopsy, a 90-minute post-exercise biopsy, and then we waited two days 
um, for a third biodex assessment. They were given a break and then they replicated the study design, but the difference is instead of doing knee extensors at 30% one rep max to failure, they did four sets to failure using 80% of their one rep max. And then of course, the study design was replicated uh, just like the 30% condition. Uh, this is just showing you the number of repetitions um, uh, on average, right, uh, during each condition. And you can clearly see um, when they were training uh, at their 30% 1RM training load, um, sets were, were very uh, repetitious, so to speak, right? So the first set on average participants had to had to perform 73 repetitions of le leg extensors uh, in order to get to volitional fatigue. And it, it looked very painful. <laughs> um, uh, whereas those, you know, the, the condition when they came in and they did their 80% uh, training valve uh, on average, it took about 18 repetitions to get to failure. So clearly each set um, within the lower load, higher volume condition, they, they were doing a lot more repetitions. This gives you sort of the sum of all four sets. Um, what is interesting is that the volume load, right? So, so basically the amount of weight lifted per set, it was higher during set one using this low load, high volume condition. But thereafter, um, the volume load was sort of equalized during sets two, three, and four. And then if you look at the total volume load or the total weight lifted, it was numerically higher when you looked at, uh, or when you compared 30% one-arm training to 80% one-arm training, but that was not statistically significant. So that's interesting. Now, this is entirely way too cluttered um, to go through, but these are our muscle biopsy data. And, and I'm just gonna pop this up and I'm gonna say all of the biopsy markers that were related to anabolic signaling. So we looked at some of the phosphorylation markers um, related to muscle protein synthesis. And we also looked at some inflammation markers, proteolysis markers, growth factor markers at the mRNA level. What was interesting is regardless of load, there were time effects, but there was, there was no differentiation, right? Uh, meaning that the biopsy data, when looking at the 30% one-arm training and comparing it to the 80% one-arm training uh, was exactly the same when looking at these molecular markers. So we didn't see any differentiation there. What the main finding from Cody's data was, in our opinion, is when you look at the biodex data. So this is signifying the percent change in knee extensor peak torque when comparing the post time points to the pre uh, in each training condition. So this is showing um, the changes in knee extensor peak torque following 30% one RM training. You can see there was a decrease at post and that was you know, regardless uh, of the um, angular velocity set on the biodex and that that decrease from pre sort of persist, uh, persisted, excuse me, uh, two days following the training valve. This, these are the 80% 1RM training data. And what we noted was, you know, following this higher load, lower volume training, yes, we observed a decrease in the extensor peak torque, but it wasn't nearly as robust when compared uh, to the 30% one RM condition, okay? So what we learned from Cody's study was that if you were to take muscle biopsies and you were to look at molecular markers, you probably won't see much of a difference when comparing high load, lower volume versus lower load, higher volume training. And, and these are, I'm making this conclusion from our data as well as Stu Phillips data because his laboratory has sort of shown that as well. Okay. Uh, in our minds then, it doesn't make much sense to train with uh, low loads and higher volume because I can tell you looking at these participants, it doesn't look like it's much fun 
to train at 30% one round max and perform a set of 70 or 80 repetitions, right? You can get sort of the same molecular bang for your buck if you train with heavier loads. And then really the main finding, and this is from Cody's data, is that there seems to be this residual fatigue uh, when you train 30% 1RM to failure and that fatigue lasts or persists two days after the bout when you compare it to the bout where individuals trained at 80% of their one, one rep max to failure, okay? Now, this is the study that's unpublished uh, from Chris Van, and uh, we took 15 college-aged male participants that were well-trained, um, and by the way, this is just showing you, uh, you know, the, what we did on each leg. I, I didn't uh, add this little guy in his underwear for, you know, um, <laughs> just for the sake of it. Um, but at baseline, from each leg, we took an MRI, ultrasound, and muscle biopsy, right? And then uh, after this baseline assessment or baseline testing battery on each leg, uh, we had participants trained three days per week where one leg was randomly assigned to a higher load and lower volume training condition. So this is giving you the total sets per week uh, for the exercise. And it was two exercises. It was a single leg leg press and a single leg leg extensor exercise. Um, that they were that they were performing and you can see from weeks one through six we were increasing uh, the training load in this in this high load training leg now in this high volume training leg uh, we basically kept um, the, the the percent one rm the same as as the study progressed but we increased the volume so that we were basically adding a set per exercise every week. Um, and then after this, this, this uh, six week unilateral training intervention, uh, we did the same testing batteries where we did a post-intervention MRI ultrasound and, and muscle biopsy. And so these are some of our preliminary data and we're currently writing these data up. Uh, what is interesting is that the high volume leg we saw uh, basically, according to the ultrasound data, uh, we did see a significant increase in hypertrophy in the high load leg. We didn't see that increase in terms of statistical significance. Um, we, we also, and this is sort of against our hypotheses because we thought that uh, leg, leg extensor um, strength would increase more so in the high load leg. We'll come to find out it doesn't. Um, high volume training as well as high load training seem to elicit uh, the similar increase in, in strength. And then this right here, uh, I'm going to go back a slide. This is a misnomer and I apologize, but this should be leg press strength. Uh, and we saw yet again um, the high volume training as well as the high load training uh, eliciting similar increases in leg press strength. Okay. So uh, it looks like I can sort of train with whatever load I want so long as it's to failure, right? I mean, that's what at least Stu Phillips' original data set, said in 2012. Um, you know, our most recent study uh, that Chris Van uh, did uh, sort of reiterated that concept, um, although there is some, some data to disagree with that with Nate Jenkins, right? So it's sort of up in the air. Um, well, I say not so fast, my friend, because uh, one, one, I think, question that needs to be answered is, should people be training to muscular failure uh, in the first place? And this is a study by Mike Stone's group where they took two groups of well-trained college-age male participants, and they had one group that trained using um, relative percentages, and they were not training to failure during each training bout. And then they had a second group uh, that basically trained to muscular uh, failure during each training bout. Uh, and, and they had these participants training three days per week for 10 weeks. And so what you're looking at are data from their study 
showing that uh, if you train to failure, uh, you, you do see a numerical but not a significant increase in type one and type two fiber CSA or hypertrophy. Uh, whereas if you prescribe loads and you don't train to failure, uh, you see these significant increases in cellular hypertrophy. And these are ultrasound data um, of the vastus lateralis and it sort of paints the same story. You can see that uh, if you don't train to failure, uh, you, you get a uh, significant increase in, in VL hypertrophy. And if you train to failure, that significance um, disappears. And this is uh, from the discussion of their paper. Uh, they say that performing a resistance training to failure uh, delays recovery of neuromuscular performance by up to 24 to 40 out, 48 hours post-exercise. Uh, and ultimately that um, can lead to, you know, subsequent bout of trainings being suboptimal. And so if, if, if you train to failure all of the time, what you're essentially doing is sort of fatiguing the system so that training load over 10 weeks may not be optimized, okay? Another point I wanna bring up is, um, you know, in these studies, and we're sort of guilty of this, we, we typically look at muscle fiber CSA and we say, hey, look, you know, at the cellular level, hypertrophy is, is optimal in one condition over the other. Um, but a lot of details are overlooked in terms of the molecular adaptations to high load versus higher volume training paradigms. Uh, and so these are papers from our laboratory. They were done in, in separate participants. Uh, in our first study, we did progressive overload for six weeks using 60% 1RM. <coughs> this was very, very high volume training. For those that have read this paper, um, it was incredibly high volume training. Uh, and then we had a, a second study uh, where we basically had participants training for 10 weeks. And this was uh, what I would call low volume, high load training. They were using weights corresponding to 80 uh, to 90% of their 1RM, okay? And both studies were done in college age males, different groups of participants in each study. So the main findings from the very high volume training study when looking at the biopsy data is that we actually didn't see any change in fiber CSA with this six week extraordinarily high volume uh, training. Uh, now these are DEXA data, and this is plotting the change in DEXA data from pre to week six. Uh, the one thing that I'd like to point out is um, as the training ensued and as, as the study progressed, uh, what these bars represent are weekly volume loads on average. Um, uh, incredibly, we, we started people out at, at 10 sets of lift uh, of exercise per week and we progressed them to 32 sets per week. Now, when you look at the raw DEXA data in terms of the um, lean soft tissue mass, we saw this linear increase in lean soft tissue mass and we interpret that as muscle mass. Uh, but we also corrected that for extracellular water uh, using BIS, uh, which is bioelectrical impedance spectroscopy. And when we did that, what we noted was, you know, from weeks one to three of training, um, we sort of saw this corresponding increase in extracellular water corrected DEXA data. But then as we continued to increase volume, um, you know, this extracellular water corrected DEXA data sort of tapered off. And the way we interpreted this data was, look, if you engage in extremely high volume training, uh, even though a DEXA or hydrostatic wang or whatever is gonna tell you that lean tissue mass or muscle mass is increasing with training, uh, perhaps some of that is due to fluid shifts. Perhaps that's a retention of extracellular water, right? Whether it's swelling or edema or what have you. And so that's one thing to take in, into consideration um, when you're looking at, at training data is, you know, are, are the gains in muscle hypertrophy truly gains in muscle hypertrophy or is some of that attributed to shifts in fluid where we have extracellular fluid increases and that, that doesn't 
um, contribute to the functional aspect of, of muscle hypertrophy. And in these participants, we also took the muscle biopsies and we did uh, proteomics, which is looking at all of the major proteins um, in the muscle. And what we noted were that uh, high volume, extremely high volume resistance training uh, sort of bioenergetically primed the muscle to where there were a lot of enzymes upregulated um, uh, that produce ATP. So uh, basically creatine kinase was one that was upregulated. A lot of enzymes in the glycolysis pathway were upregulated. So, so we sort of concluded that high volume training, you know, no increase in fiber CSA and granted these people only trained for six weeks and they were pretty well trained prior to engaging in this training. Um, but we didn't see an increase in, in, in fiber CSA. You know, we saw an increase in whole body lean mass, but some of that was probably due to um, extracellular water increases. Uh, and then at the molecular level, this sort of training um, upregulates uh, bioenergetic um, enzymes uh, to produce uh, ATP. In the second study, this is our high load training for 10 weeks. We did see an increase in type two fiber CSA, but not type one fiber CSA. Um, we saw this increase in back squat strength. It was I think 20 or 30% increase. Um, what was interesting was we didn't do DEXA, but we did um, bioelectrical impedance. And we actually saw a one kilogram decrease in fat-free mass, or you can interpret that as muscle mass. And then when we did proteomics, um, um, we found that, you know, those enzymes that were upregulated with high volume training were not upregulated in skeletal muscle with high load training, right? So our interpretation of these data um, is, one, I just sort of mentioned this, but I'm going to re-mention this, uh, you know, with high volume training, I think beware of fluid shifts, right? If, if you engage in very high volume training, uh, you can see perhaps increases in, in extracellular water. With high load training, we thought it was extremely um, uh, weird, for lack of a better term, that we, we saw this, this decrease in muscle mass. But again, we, we thought, hey, perhaps these individuals came into the laboratory and they were doing higher volume training and then we put them on higher load training and there was a fluid shift to where, you know, we saw this, this decrease in muscle mass, but it wasn't functional muscle mass. Perhaps it was just due to fluid shift. In terms of our proteomic data with high volume training, we think that high volume resistance training leads to metabolic conditioning where the ATP, PCR and glycolytic pathways are fine tuned to deal with lifting uh, basically um, lower uh, loads for, for higher uh, repetitions. Um, and then with higher load training, we don't see any sort of metabolic conditioning occurring, at least according to our proteomic data, okay? And then with higher volume training, uh, if you do it excessively, uh, especially training to failure, we think that residual fatigue uh, may impair your subsequent bouts of training, okay? Uh, and then with higher load training, uh, we don't think that there's as much residual fatigue, okay? And I do wanna note that all of this applies to previously trained individuals uh, in terms of what our laboratory has, has researched, okay? So the, this debate continues. There are plenty of papers out there uh, that you can Look at Brad Schoenfeld, he's a, he's a good friend and he's done meta-analyses on this topic. Uh, he published this one recently and it, it basically suggests that high volume training favors hypertrophy in trained males. Um, this paper right here suggests high low training favors hypertrophy and strength in untrained females. Uh, and then this recent paper by Haley Bergstrom's group shows that both training methods can similarly increase strength um, and untrained females, right? Um, this is a study uh, out of China and Stu Phillips was involved, um, but they did uh, their 30% uh, 1RM training to failure versus 80% 1RM training to failure. And they, they basically looked at muscle biopsies and, and studied the mitochondrial adaptations that occurred. 
What is interesting, and we're starting to get down this rabbit hole as well, is that if you train using, uh, you know, 30% one rep max with higher volume, you may see alterations in mitochondrial markers, um, suggesting that you can get some mitochondrial adaptations um, with lower load and higher volume resistance training compared to higher load, lower volume resistance training. Okay. And then this paper right here suggests that, you know, if you train basically with the neon colored dumbbells, as I like to call it, right, 20% one rep max um, to failure, this doesn't elicit optimal adaptations uh, in that 80% one rep max uh, training elicits the best strength and hypertrophy changes. Um, this paper is, was by Stu's group uh, recently. It was just one bout of training um, where they compared 30% you know, 1RM training to failure versus 80% 1RM training to failure. Uh, and they, they wanted to see our muscle fibers activated in a similar manner. They used glycogen staining with the intent of showing that those fibers which showed a decrease in glycogen uh, were activated. And what was interesting is that both fiber types are similarly activated uh, with each type of or style of training. And then finally, um, this was put out in 2020. I always like meta-analyses because at the end of the day, it sort of settles the conflict at least, um, you know, uh, temporarily until there's another meta-analysis published on the topic. Uh, but Jozo, what he did was he, he wanted to compare uh, the type 1 fiber versus type 2 fiber adaptations with uh, lower load, higher volume versus higher load and lower volume resistance training. Uh, and basically, uh, with, with type 1 fiber hypertrophy, it doesn't seem that either training paradigm really uh, favors uh, type 1 hi uh, fiber hypertrophy. Uh, but when you look at type 2 fiber hypertrophy, you see a, a slight benefit uh, when you engage in, in higher load training. So with all of these data in mind, you know, how do you train again? And people ask me after this presentation, well, so what do you recommend, Mike? I mean, uh, you presented a ton of data, right? That some of it seems to be contradictory. Um, you know, I think if you're, if you're wanting to prioritize uh, strength and hypertrophy, uh, train with higher loads, you know, 70, 80, 90% 1RM, right? I, I think a good study would be this. Uh, if we have people engaging in this conventional sort of 80% 1RM training uh, and, and the study was long enough, you know, can you throw in a 30% fail training bout? And does that do some interesting things in relation to metabolic adaptation or mitochondrial adaptation, right? Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, Cody, you know, he, when he was in my lab, he, he sort of harped on this point, but the idea is that you don't want to train to failure all the time uh, because that's going to have residual effects in terms of being able to perform your next training bout um, optimally. Um, so if you're training with, you know, lighter weights or heavier weights, um, the idea there is that you don't, you don't train to failure all the time. Uh, with that, um, I really want to thank all of you all for taking time to attend, and um, thanks. I said uh, Justin, uh, th but thank you, Dustin, <laughs> for the uh, the invite, and thank you for Texas um, ACSM as well. And um, I will take questions at this point. All right, thanks, Mike. And on behalf of Texas ACSM and all our virtual attendees today, uh, we appreciate you. Um, it looks like the first question we had, um, most of the data looked like you presented was on men. Um, so one of the questions was, what about women? Yeah, that's a great question. So Haley's paper was in females. Uh, we, we haven't done a, a volume load study in females. Now we've done resistance training studies in females, but we haven't done volume load studies in females. Um, so I, you know, I, I, would, I would hate to generalize these concepts 
uh, to females. I just, I don't think there's enough data that, or, you know, any enough studies that have differentiated volume load um, and, and what the adaptations are in, in females. Uh, but uh, Haley Bergstrom, look at some of her work, because I believe she has a little bit more data than the one paper I presented on that. Okay. Um, and then the next one, I think this, when, when this question popped up, I think it was in reference to the last, um, I think it was your specific data, the last study you went over of your, your own data. Um, it says, are the pre and post training used to measure the individual's hypertrophy from the beginning to the end? So, yeah, that's the idea is that if, if um, every participant in these studies, they do, they, they donate a muscle biopsy uh, at baseline as well as 48 to 72 hours following the training bout. So that's for all participants. Um, and then, you know, we get the individual data points and we average them to sort of put these bar graphs on paper. Did that answer the question? Um, I, on my end, I, I guess if the, the person who asked that one, if they have a point of clarification, they can, they can type in, um, to the Q and A. Okay. Um, so the next one, um, was there a difference in endurance athletes, um, or were these studies solely focused on resistance trained individuals? No, that's a good question. Um, we've a uh, very good question, actually. So these are all in our laboratory, at least these are people with prior resistance training experience. Now, some of the papers at the end of my talk where I was flashing the titles of those papers, you know, there, there are some studies that have been done in untrained uh, versus prior trained. But I don't think anybody has looked at um, with these volume load questions, right? Training with higher volume, lower load versus higher load, lower volume. I don't think anyone's looked at putting people that have prior endurance training experience, um, you know, on these protocols. So I think that's an interesting question. And I say that because for the endurance athlete, you know, you want to prioritize mitochondrial adaptations. And so uh, that that would be something that would certainly be worth uh, looking at for sure. Okay. Um, next one, what's your op opinion on training to failure volume as in how many times per week per month would you recommend people incorporating that? Yeah, I'm gonna shoot from the hip because I have no data points to back up what I'm going to say. Um, you know, I think Mike Stone's crew with Kevin Carroll and, and, you know, Cody, when he came to my lab, he did his master's with Mike. So a lot of what I've learned from Cody, um, you know, sort of comes from the Mike Stone lineage. Um, it's just not a good way to train much. <laughs> I mean, I've, Minimize it when you can, I suppose. Uh, and the idea is that you will certainly hamper um, or compromise your ability to lift weights in subsequent training bouts. Subsequent training bouts. Now, data from our laboratory says, look, if you if you you know do a bout of training where you're doing your you know sets of 100 repetitions at 30 percent one RM, you know, two days later you're you're going to have this. Uh, increased sort of decrement in, in knee extensor peak torque. And so what that tells us is, you know, use those training bouts sparingly, this extraordinarily high volume uh, sort of training, uh, and make sure that you have built-in recovery after that. Don't try to uh, go in and then do a high load session two days later because it's going to be a bad lift, right? Given that you're going to have these neuromuscular decrements or this residual fatigue. Okay. Um, let's see. We got time for a few more still. We're at 1150. Sure, um, sure. So a couple questions looking at the age of the subjects. Um, anybody looked at these different kinds of training paradigms in older individuals or what are your thoughts there? Yeah, mainly what I've seen has been college aged. Um, in terms of older, I, 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 there's nothing I've seen that's as sort of, uh, there's obviously, there's studies in older individuals uh, involving resistance training. There's plenty of that data. 
but I haven't seen these volume load questions trickle into the aged population. Um, the, I, I will mention this, the reason why we looked at uh, previously trained individuals rather than untrained individuals is that we think um, untrained individuals will respond to a lot of different training stimuli, right? Just because uh, it, it's a sledgehammer, whether it's high load or high volume, you're going to see these precipitous rises in, in hypertrophy and strength. Um, so with a trained individual, those people are basically close to their ceiling as it relates to hypertrophy and strength. And so we prefer that population because um, we feel like it can give us a little bit better resolution in terms of the effects of each form of training. But in untrained individuals, we think either form of training is, is probably going to uh, lead to this, you know, similar increases in strength and hypertrophy um, because almost any form of training is going to work, right? As long as it's consistent. Um, and I say that because if, if you talk about an untrained older individual, I think that that probably also applies. Um, you know, during the initial three months, it can be higher volume, lower load, or it can be higher load and lower volume, so long as it's consistent. You're going to see some positive outcomes there. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to combine a couple of these. We're getting a lot of questions in. So kind of as a follow-up to the endurance athlete question earlier, you had touched on maybe whether or not you expect for the endurance athlete similar metabolic changes when it comes to like PCR, mitochondrial adaptations. And then another more generic one to, towards endurance athlete would be, do you think this high volume training would be better for endurance athletes like marathoners? Yeah, you know, and uh, there are, you know, I, there are studies out there. Um, I did not include them in this presentation, but I've talked about them in a graduate class I teach. I've seen meta-analyses on weightlifting and, and endurance athletes and cyclists and things like that. Um, there's, it's sort of a mixed bag, right? Um, so high load training for an endurance athlete is is more likely to in, uh, lead to increases in, let's call it, um, uh, workload during a wind gate, for instance, right? That's that sprint power. Um, but high load training probably does nothing for an endurance athlete as it relates to muscular endurance, right? Um, higher volume training in an endurance athlete, uh, I don't, I don't know much about it. Uh, but, you know, if, if you think about some of the adaptations that we've seen um, with uh, mitochondrial dynamics and some of the things that we're starting to study, um, I think it, it could be a viable strategy, uh, at least promoting mitochondrial adaptations. Um, so I think more needs to be done there, uh, in particular, looking at mitochondrial adaptations with higher volume training uh, in endurance athletes. Okay. Um, so next one for the studies you focused on, it seemed like more of the, the emphasis was on hypertrophy and strength. Yeah. Did any of those studies also look at muscle endurance as a, another training benefit? And what does that look like? I haven't seen much on that. Um, I, you know, I think that Campos study that was, uh, the, basically the first study I presented, uh, in this lecture, they, they had looked at a surrogate of muscle endurance by having participants perform, you know, a set of leg press at 65% 1RM and they counted the number of repetitions. Um, I just can't recall that data. But long story short, yeah, I haven't seen much on, for instance, I think a good, a very, um, cool metric would be to do some sort of um, cycling task in these studies where you look at high volume versus high load um, and just look at aerobic power and see if anything is is there for the higher volume training. But I, I just haven't seen much data there. 
Um, going back, you mentioned the the need for maybe more recovery after the high load or the high volume training. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on maybe how nutrition can be considered to alleviate some of those recovery decrements? Yeah, I'm really going to have to think about that. I may not be able to answer it. I don't want to hand wave and ramble. <laughs> um, that's, I would assume, I mean, um, if you compare, for instance, sort of this, let's call it a two hour protocol on a treadmill, right? And you were to take a biopsy. Uh, we know muscle glycogen is going to be decreased on the order of 70 to 80% with just one bout of endurance exercise. With a bout of, you know, higher volume lifting, maybe it's 50%, okay? Now, 50% sounds like a lot, but a day later, you can replenish those glycogen stores, right? And you certainly can replenish your fossil creatine stores. That happens within a matter of minutes. So I'm not entirely sure that it's a depletion phenomena, which explains residual fatigue 48 hours post, right? I'm, I'm thinking it's more neuromuscular, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think we need to study that more. I'm not a, I'm not a neuromuscular physiologist. I know some, um, uh, but I think that's an interesting observation in terms of why higher volume training to failure would lead to more residual fatigue compared to higher load training. Um, I, I just don't know the answer, although I will say I don't think it's at the muscular level. I think it has to do um, with... Um, you alpha motor neuron, something going on there, uh, or, you know, CNS related rather than peripherally related. Okay. Um, let's see. We got, I think we got two more. We can try to squeeze these in and close out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one, a little lengthier. If you're looking at the Q and A yourself, um, I'm not, I can try. Okay. To, um, um, I guess asking about why was the traditional range of 65 to 75% of one RM for hypertrophy, not utilize as a separate group, um, I guess, with a slightly lower load and higher volume in the form of greater reps and sets elicit greater increases than 80 to 90% when I'm used? Mm. I, I guess this is in um, one of our, yeah, so, uh, well, that, that would be in relation maybe to, you know, some of these studies that have looked at 30% one RM. I don't know the rationale to that, honestly. And I see uh, Nate Jenkins. I don't know if this is the Nate Jenkins. <laughs> I know he's asked the next question. Uh, he too is an expert, so he can have a breakout session here and answer some of these questions. But, um, you know, the genesis of this 30% one RM training to failure, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, some of it comes from the blood flow restriction literature, right? Where they, they put a cuff on somebody and then they do this, this uh, very uh, low volume, uh, or excuse me, very low load, high volume training, and they see hypertrophy. And I think some of that, some of the reasons why that's been carried on into this area of, you know, resistance training research uh, is because of some of those protocols. Um, but the, you know, the question, why are not traditional ranges, um, uh, used or studied more, I, you know, I don't know a good question. It's just that uh, after, I think Stu Phillips put out that 2012 paper showing 30% one-arm training to failure elicited similar hypertrophy, uh, people really wanted to study the differences between 30% versus 80% or even 90% one-arm training. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah, I think actually Nate posted a link for some of the folks who had asked about older individuals earlier. He posted a link to some um, research there. So I'll leave Thank that. Thank you, Nate. I'll leave that in the Q&A so people could see and click. <laughs> um, and then the last one we have in the Q&A here is, do you think using well-trained individuals could be a limitation due to a lack of overall hypertrophy? Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of it, right? So with Cody Hahn's, you know, six-week extraordinarily high-volume training study, we saw no increases in fiber CSA, and, and we thought that was in large part due to their training status. 
Um, so some may view that as a limitation to us though, you know, going into that study, we said, hey, look, uh, these, these folks were engaged in probably moderate volume training. Um, so if we really increase their training stress and, and jack up their training volume, can we see additional hypertrophy? And so from our perspective, that's why we like um, the, the previously trained individuals, because a lot of them sort of have reached the ceiling effect in terms of hypertrophy and strength. And so from there, we think that you can get a cleaner answer um, when you modulate their training volume or their training load. All right. Hey, so Mike, I think that's all the questions. We got through a bunch of questions there. So I appreciate you leaving some time to, um, to answer those. And uh, again, on behalf of Texas ACSM and our attendees today, uh, thanks for being with us. Hey, I appreciate the time and, and all the questions. And if there's any follow-up questions, feel free. I put my email there um, and I will forward all the answers to Nate. I saw he answered me back. Uh, and so anyways, thank you. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, great. And one last thing for our attendees. Some folks have asked about the recording. We are working on a, a platform to get the recordings up. So look for an announcement from us, but um, we have recorded it. So. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks.